I'm Clarky. Uh, I work for Tito. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about my first year with AWS. Um, I was working at a company where we ran everything on bare metal in um, uh, Goswell Road, not very far from here, just off Old Street. Um, and I joined the uh, Tito, proper startup, and everything was already in AWS. And this is my introduction to it. Um, so this is my life, basically, for my first year at Tito. Um, go on, go on. Oi. Um, Tito, uh, we're, a, we're building a bunch of apps to help people learn and discover more about music. Um, we're starting with piano music uh, for uh, predominantly classical music, but we are looking at expanding genres, instruments, all sorts of stuff. And we've built a bunch of stuff. Like, it's, it's cool. Uh, but that's another talk. Uh, this is about infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to talk you through one of our APIs. And this is driving our, basically the main content inside the app. So you can browse and you can have a look and see what you want to download and play and all that sort of stuff. So it's a pretty simple app, a um, bunch of node servers. Um, our model is really simple. We've basically got four things. I think we've got four things now, five things maybe. So we've got users, uh, volumes, which is in a traditional, more audio sort of world, is an album. Um, a piece, just a track, so whatever your favorite hip hop artist is. Uh, and then a masterclass is a deep dive into one of those pieces, and this gives you uh, the ability to look at a bunch of performance, so by an actual, like, truly professional, playing the piece. So you can see what they're doing. Like, it's really useful for, if you're learning, you can see which fingers they're using and all that sort of stuff. And the way they're po positioning their elbows is apparently really important. I'm not actually that much of a musician. Um, and then we also have an explore section where you can scroll through the notation. And this professional will talk you through why the composer may have chosen certain things for that piece of music and all that sort of stuff. Like it's, it's really cool, but there's not a lot to it actually from a data point of view. So using Happy, Happy's cool. Like no one needs to say anymore, it's cool. Um, so the requirements, I needed a database, right? I need, it needed to be clustered. I didn't want it to break. Like this is kind of my job on the line. Um, backups, if someone did like drop table users, it's like, oh, that's really sad. Um, <laughs> I needed an application, so we're at Node, so LNUG, so Node, it's obvious. But again, I needed to run that on some servers. <sighs> Someone had told me once it needed to be clustered, so yeah, cool, we'd do that as well. And I, ne I wanted it to be really easy to deploy, so continuous integration, deployment, this is all stuff that I'm really passionate about and have been for a long time, so it needed to just do all of that as well. Um, so what, what actually happened, like in my previous place, was this. Um, and this is what happens when you get an infrastructure team involved. Unfortunately, the infrastructure guy that got, did this with me isn't here anymore. But there's some really cool stuff. Like, and this is really good. Like, this is like best-in-class way of deployment if you're running it on your own bare metal. So we're using Jenkins, Puppet, mCollective. We've got app servers. We've got, in fact, we had three different levels of app stuff going on. Uh, Git, uh, like there was stuff that we weren't even doing as well over here. Like that was like that was really bad. Um, so anyway, I didn't want that anymore because this was it was just me doing this. Um, so I came across AWS and uh, there was a lot of icons and there was a lot of a lot of acronyms and a lot of jargon. And basically, this was my introduction. So we're going to play a game. Who's who's used AWS? Right, loads of you. Right. So you're going to be good at this. Please, please, please. Animation, animation. Right. Yeah. What's this? No, close. RDS. Yes, yeah, RDS. So relational database service, super simple. You can choose whatever database you want. Mice, pretty much, within reason. Uh, SQL, so relational. But MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, or uh, I can't even pronounce it, whatever that one is. Super simple setup, fill in a few boxes, you're off, you've got a database. Automated backups, done. It's multi-AZ, so it's clustered across multiple different data centers. It just takes half of my requirements. It's perfect. Done. So what about the application? So next one. This one. No, it's the other one. They look so similar, it's really <laughs> annoying. This one's Elastic Beanstalk. 
So, what is Elastic Beanstalk? Uh, platform as a service or infrastructure as a code? Um, it's kind of a bit like Heroku, um, although I've not really used Heroku, so I can't really say that. Um, but it's basically a layer of ab abstraction over cloud formation. So what's cloud formation? It, cloud formation is really the configuration the infrastructure stuff underneath. But this basically is like a higher order version of it. Um, like, it's really cool. It's really beautiful. Like, so simple to use. Um, so setting it up, we basically get, get this big list of stuff you can choose. Um, we're going to choose Node, obviously. The next thing is the environment type. I realize that's a bit low, but you might be able to see it. So you get to choose whether you want a single instance or a load balancer auto-scaling. Why would you choose one over the other? So for all of my proof of concepts that are just completely throwaway, just go for the single instance. It's dirt cheap. Um, in fact, it's even lower than the free tier in AWS. So AWS give you a whole bunch of stuff for free, um, including basically a whole single load balancing environment, um, which you should use. And I probably shouldn't say this, but you can actually get more than one free duration as well, if you just change your email address. Um, <laughs> I may have done that. Uh, you then get to choose your instance type. And this is where I was like, uh, what do I want? Um, there's lots to choose from. Um, and and it, it completely depends on your application and what you're doing. If you're basically just running a simple Node app, it doesn't. <sighs> I'm going to say it doesn't really matter, but again, no, no app is the same. Try one and see. You can always change it later. And this is what's really nice, is that it's all configurable later on as well. Um, we run pretty much all of our stuff on T2 Small. And the only reason why we don't go for the micros is because our NPM installs actually take up a lot of CPU. And it took way too long and ran out of memory on the micros to actually install some of the packages that we were installing. Um, so if you're a Nodes module NPM maintainer, consider what you're actually choosing to push out because it can have an impact on this sort of stuff. Um, so you're costing me money, all your free software, right? <laughs> um, no, it's really cool. Um, and then uh, we actually run a bunch of the bigger ones. So the T2 stuff, the T is general purpose. It's burstable. So if you have spikes in your uh, load, it's quite cool because you basically build credits over time and then you use them under high load. Um, the M stuff is non-burstable, so if you're under consistent loads, just use those. Uh, the C ones are high CPU, so that's like if you're really intensive, uh, we actually could probably run a couple of those for doing some of our audio alignment stuff, which is really intensive C stuff. Um, and then there's memory intensive, like there's loads of documentation on this, like try one, see does your application work, does it fit, test it, you know, put it under some load, see what happens and move on. So I've just shown you the user interface for building some of these, for setting up your application. But there is also a CLI, or command line. Why would you use one over the other? Now, I've, the first couple that I used, I did. I built through this, the user interface just because it was kind of a comfortable thing. But don't do that um, longer term, because the UI is rubbish. Like, and it's like, uh, it bombs out. There's like, some really bad things in there. Um, and also, I don't think everything is in there that you can do on the CLI. The CLI is also scriptable. So you can put it in your build server, and you can deploy whole applications on PRs. You can deploy whole applications on however you want. Um, and I'll go into a bit more of that a bit later on. But like, the scriptable nature of it is really, really nice. All of our builds look exactly the same for all of our environments. So actually, we could extract that and, pull it and kind of centralize our build system, which is quite nice. So, uh, one more. Who's this guy? Nah, OK, disappointed. So, Lang Lang, he's a Chinese pianist. He's a superstar. So, remember the app that we're building? He's massive in China, like big, like really big. And he caused us some problems, um, big problems. Um, and one of the things that I had to learn very quickly about AWS, uh, regions, AZ, all of this stuff is just like, ah, uh, like never had to deal with this. Everything was in Goswell Road. I could walk up there. <laughs> <laughs> all of this did not make sense to me. Um, so a region is basically a geographic area. It's pretty simple. It's like uh, there's one in Ireland. There's one, now one in London. They're opening one in Paris. There's also one in Tokyo, which is quite cool. And then an AZ is basically a data center or a 
I, probably a cluster of data centers in that geographic region, and they have, between them, super low latency. So you can deploy servers in each one, and they can pretty much talk to each other really, really quickly. Um, so if you're clustering things, you want to put them in those same AZs. If you're doing full geographic thing, you need to be able to basically allow for fault tolerance with longer distance traffic. These are the regions that AWS have now. Um, so the green ones are the new ones. There's one opening in Paris soon, and I think that's the second one in China. So they do have a presence in China, but there is a big but, and we'll, we'll come to that. This is cool. So I had my application running in Ireland with a database and everything else, and then I then Lang Lang came along. And trust me, I didn't know about this guy either. Um, he came along, and I ran this command, and I now have his application with his configuration in Tokyo with two servers and exactly the same as the one in Ireland. And it took like five minutes and it's there, it's done. Uh, so cool, right? Yeah? But it still didn't solve the problem. <laughs> because we also have a bunch of content. So our application, the storefront, is just like an e-commerce. You can go in and choose and browse. But we actually had like big zip files of content. This masterclass is four videos, three videos, four, four, uh, N videos, um, all in one big zip file that we were delivering uh, onto the application. Now, don't criticize that. We'll, we, can, we can fix that later. But anyway, we're delivering large packets of data onto an app, long distances. So, one more. Yes, on one. So. S3. Lots of people have used S3. It's just buckets. You can stick blobs of data. In fact, Nelson did a really good talk on building a chat application on top of S3. That worked. So it was an interesting like, use. I'd never seen it before. You basically have buckets, which is just somewhere where you can throw stuff. Think about the way that you're going to structure the keys in there before you start just throwing stuff in, because you can end up with a lot of mess. Um, permissions. Again, consider how you want to access this data. Uh, there's like. Yeah, we had a lot of problem accessing some stuff that we thought we could access. Uh, what, last week? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, just consider it before you start doing it. You can do things like set positive permissions and then set negative permissions on top. Uh, and that's what kind of screwed us over. Um, object versioning is quite nice. So you can basically keep throwing assets in with the same key. So your application can choose the key that you want to store it under. And then AWS will basically increment a version number underneath and can return that history. So it's not like a, a truly nice Git thing, but you basically get history of what you did with that single object key all, all the way through. It can also do static website hosting. So this is quite nice. You click a checkbox and it will start hosting it as if it's a website. Um, that's the way you run all of our static sites through there, and that's quite nice now. But we still had this problem. Again, Lang Lang keeps coming back. I've never met the guy, though. Um, so, last one. What's this? Yes, it is CloudFront, but it's different to the icon in the AWS user interface. Why? It's different. It's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, document it. Anyway, we can come back to that. So, CloudFront is a content delivery network. It's really easy to configure to set, sit in front of both S3 and your Elastic Beanstalk applications. So immediately, got problems in China. I just need to get the, everything over there as quickly as possible. This was going to be the golden bullet. Like, it's beyond silver. This is amazing. But, so this is a big but. When we did this, there wasn't even the Beijing pop, which is the point of presence inside China for AWS. And they do have now a point of presence inside China, which is really good. There's still a but with that. But this was our, uh, some metrics that we ran with a China-specific CDN, so a China-specific content delivery network. And like, yes, they're selling it to me, so it's obviously a little bit weighted. But this, this and this was actually what we were seeing. We, we had 80,000 downloads in one week in China, and 80% of them had problems downloading our content. Um, and that was through the Apple CDN. So like, if someone's going to get it good, you kind of thought Apple might be all right, but apparently not. Um, so we had real issues. So we thought we'd bring it out, externalize it, and we could actually have a go at doing it ourselves. 
Um, and sure enough, we could have got it a lot better. We could have got it up to 90% delivery rather than 20% delivery. Um, but the minimum pricing for this was a thousand pounds a month. And we hadn't proven the market yet in China. So we basically just went, sorry, dude, we're kind of out of China. So uh, this was a big problem for us. So think about your, where you want to position your application before you start trying to deliver content. So what happened next? Like, that's a really sad story, right? <laughs> uh, it's not all bad. Um, our application is still running, and it works in most of the world. Most. Um, we have a bunch of auto-scaling Elastic Beanstalk APIs. We also have a bunch of auto-scaling Elastic Beanstalk instances behind a queue. Now, I've not covered those, but you can basically stick them behind an SQS queue to, off to do offline processing. So if you're not in, if it doesn't need to be real time and you can do it a bit later, just stick it behind a queue and it will just run automatically. Um, we have our S3 buckets. We have two CloudFront CDNs. So this is quite a nice little trick that I picked up. It takes a long time for the configuration to propagate on CloudFront distributions. And if you're not quite sure on what the configuration should be, just set N of them up. You can always take them down again. <laughs> um, I might have done that a few times. Uh, it's, all it's all learning though, right? So this is now what we've got, a bunch of these and a bunch of these. Um, we're now running 13 Elastic Beanstalk applications, environments. So these are all clustered or single instances. Some of them behind SQS queues, as I said. A bunch of S3 buckets, a few CloudFront distributions. Some of them may be configuration changes. I'm not sure. I need to check. Uh, Elastic Cache for all of our session storage. So you can basically choose to run Redis or Memcache. It's really nice, super simple to set up. One little caveat on that, though, is you can only access it from inside the AWS world. So if you want to access it from your local machine, you basically have to proxy in and like it's hassle. So you may want to choose to run Redis on an EC2 instance instead. But again, it's all balance of maintenance versus um, hassle. And then we've actually scrapped RDS in favor of DynamoDB. But that is another story and still a lot of hassle. Um, so AWS is great. It really is. Uh, I learned a lot in the year. Like, and, it, and one thing I would say is it's a lot better than running your stuff on Gosware Road. That's all I would say. Um, my old boss used to have a problem uh, or nightmares with an um, uh, oil tanker blowing up outside the data center on Goswell Road. It's a slight risk. But um, yeah, we don't have that anymore, I think. Um, <laughs> the one big problem, though, is vendor lock-in. So AWS has got a whole bunch of stuff. And every day, I find new things that they do. Uh, my latest ones are certificate management. Free SSL certificates, wildcard SSL certificates, free. But you can only use it on their services. Um, incognito, so user management, like beautiful, really nice. All, all stuff, like done. Uh, code commit, so GitHub, but in AWS. Um, code build, code, like there's just like, ah, there's so much stuff. Uh, you basically just have to stop, just to accept it, it's fine. Um, and it's still not great for China. Now they are getting better, they have a point of presence, and you can run stuff outside of China. However, you still have to go through the Chinese government, um, <laughs> which is, a, I think, at the last count, was about a minimum of 15 grand initial outlay to set up a business in China to then be able to use the AWS services and anyone else inside. Um, there are hidden limits. This I found out last week or the week before, I think, one, one of the two. Um, I was trying to, I did an EB clone to get up a new set of instances to try a different version of a particular application. Um, and it basically said, no, it said, uh, you've reached your limit. <laughs> I was like, what? We're only running like 26 servers. I was like, how? Like, no, you told me I could scale to 10,000. Um, but behind the scenes, they actually put a cap on the number of instances that you can have of any one type of server. And that is 10. Um, so we were, we'd managed to get by by having basically 10 of each. Uh, type and then when I tried to deploy two more and it said no. So then you basically just have to ring them up and say, "Can I have a bit more?" And they go, "All right, cool." Here you go. Your limit's now 50. <laughs> I think it's to try and keep the budgets <laughs> down, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and the documentation—it's all there. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of my introduction to AWS. It's been a really fun year. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, Sometimes pulled my hair out, sometimes kind of did one of those like, yeah. But um, yeah, any questions? Whoa.
Go on, stay over here, Sam. So. Oh, oh, Mike, Mike, roaming Mike. Elastic Container Service. Have you used it? What's your take on it? No, but um, so we're doing some hefty uh, audio alignment stuff, which takes a MIDI file and a performance audio and tries to match them um, with, uh, in partnership with Queen Mary University. And their stuff is in like dirty C stuff, and the, it only runs on Ubuntu. And this is all running on AWS's Linux thing, and so we couldn't get it to work. So it's like, ah, sod it. Stick it in Docker. Go on, off you go. And you can actually run Docker through. Um, EB, Elastic Beanstalk. Um, but no, I haven't used the Elastic Container Service at all. Yes? Um, how do you manage all the services? Are you just using point delicate interface or do you stuck it into like Chef or like how do you manage all those services? So we use Team City to do all of our builds. And um, basically what we do is we run a, um, a prod and a dev branch. And we, we, uh, we fork off dev. Uh, we do all of our stuff on Jira ticket feature branches. Those then get merged into dev. They get automatically deployed straight out onto dev. We can QA. Then we then go through a review process into prods, which then automatically gets pushed out straight to prod. Um, like it's a lightweight. Like it's continuous delivery. Um, pretty hands off. Like we trust our devs. Thanks. He's one. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions uh, over here? Cyril, run. <gasps> I have first a few remarks to your speech and then one question on solution. Sure. Um, CLI it has all the betas far before they are released on uh, MUI. So okay. even there is up to one year gap in between them. So just keep looking manuals for CLI, update them every day, because you can have some goodies that no one knows about. Um, S3 hates huge number of files. If you try to deploy a package application, like a single page application, well, like Webpack or something like that, Yes, true. It will take for you, let's say, one day to upload to megabyte application there are many files. And S3 is very slow without cloud front, even if you're not thinking about uh, delivering different files. You cannot do SSL on your own domain without cloud front. And one question. If you are, because I already realized that you are looking to optimize your cost, why, especially in, oh, maybe you have to thought um, on the jobs which you're doing on SQS, or on Rails API. Have you thought about using Lambda and API gateway? Yes, so uh, we have, but again, most of our offline stuff is this audio processing, which is in C, which, uh, as far as I'm aware, probably wouldn't work very well with Lambda. So on Lambda, you can have like no JavaScript, so you can transfer most of your like, stuff over there. So for us, it's amazing because it scales infinitely between the online and offline memory and five minute execution, so quite a long rest. Or you can put Python or JavaScript over that, so quite a choice. Cool, very. Everything's an experiment, right? <laughs> Any more? Oh, one more. Thank you. Yeah, a quick question for a new project or a new business. Would you rather uh, uh, go straight away, uh, straight uh, to AWS, set up a Beanstalk instance and get rolling with it, or start a bare metal uh, Ansible provisioning or Puppet or whatever on whatever server is available? It's a good question. Um, so from my experience, and I tried to spin up a business on my own with a friend, like a disaster, um, <laughs> but uh, that was when I learned that you could actually use th like two free tiers um, quite nicely uh, to experiment with. The, the, the most important thing when you're setting up a business is to just go as fast as you can. Um, and if you're spending time in configuration, don't bother. Um, I think the quote, I missed it from uh, uh, Elastic Beanstalk's documentation, is it's the fastest way to spin up an application on AWS. Um, it really does not take very long. Um, I was going to do a little demo, but then I got a bit of stage fright, so I thought, no, I won't do that. Um, but like, it really is really quick. Um, and then to clone it, if you wanted to basically just go, yeah, fine, that's working but I just want to just try something over here. Just clone, change, go, deploy, and you're done. Uh, something else that you can do really nicely with Elastic Beanstalk, which I've never done as part of my deployments, is you can just switch the URLs. So you can do proper true green, blue, whatever, what's, two colors, um, deployments, where you deploy your latest application over here, get it all up and running, and then you can deploy like your existing one, and then you just switch the URLs, and behind the scenes, CloudFront doesn't know any different, and your traffic just gets routed. Um, that's really nice. Um, so I, 
for me, it's the whatever, like whatever tool you're comfortable with. It, Elastic Beanstalk is like, I use it all the time. I love it. Um, I'm not getting paid for this, by the way, but um, <laughs> I, it, it's so simple. And it is, it, but it is also super flexible. You can go really deep with the configuration. So you're asking about Elastic Container Service. That's really nice, but we didn't need to do that. We could wrap our instance in a, in a Docker container and just deploy it, and it works. But then we still get to choose all of these different instance sizes. We can choose to deploy it however we want. You can have up to 10,000 behind a single load balancer. Like, I am not scared that this is going to fall down as long as people stay outside of China. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK, yeah. we're done. Well, if there are any more questions, maybe they could be also in the pub. One more thing. Uh, we are available to download in the App Store. It's <laughs> $2.99 a month. Just got to get that in there.